these big fast fashion companies, they'll see a bodysuit on Kylie Jenner on a Tuesday and they'll have 500 units of, that, of a dupe of that bodysuit in their UK warehouse by Friday. So they will have designed, sampled, had 500 units produced and shipped from a manufacturing facility that's like probably in like China. Mm. Um, and what happens is that not only does that put loads of pressure on the manufacturing facility and the workers, but um, there's often like issues with design or production and a lot of the pieces have to go uh, to landfill, end up in landfill. They're just chucking product away because not enough time and energy and effort has gone into making those products perfect. Like for our recent collection, the sampling process was about four months long because I just had to make sure that every single detail was not only like aesthetically perfect, but functionally perfect. Um, so I think that's the big differentiator between uh, independent labels and fast fashion brands. We're on our way to meet Imogen Evans, founder of Imi Studios. I've been following Imogen's journey for quite some time, having watched her grow on social media with now over 75,000 followers and no sign of her slowing down. Imogen's bold colours, daring designs and unique edge really make her stand out from the crowd. She has caught the eye of celebrity stylists and celebrities themselves, including Doja Cat, who she recently made custom pieces for. Imogen is proof that through hard work, determination, being yourself and understanding your audience, you can grow an online brand successfully without compromising your values. You didn't start off the, the normal kind of route to get to where you are today. Um, give us a bit of the backstory of how Amy Studios was created. Yeah, so I decided when I was about 15 that I wanted to pursue like fashion design. Um, and I knew while I was at school I wouldn't be able to start like a brand or anything. I, I didn't have like the time or like the expertise. But I recognised that I could start like posting online and build up a uh, social media following which would, would help me later down the line. So I started a fashion blog which I updated like once a week. Um, and I grew like an okay following like on my personal account which actually did like I was right like that did really help me when I did start my brand. but. When I left school, I actually was rejected from my first choice university. Mm. And because I'm a super stubborn person, I basically decided I didn't really want to go anywhere else. Like I'd been accepted to other universities, but I decided I didn't want to go. And um, so I went and did a one year course in Milan so I could reapply to St. Martin's, which was my like dream uni. Okay. And while I was in Milan, I just, again, was posting loads online, like posting on social media. And then that's when I got approached to do uh, Vancouver Fashion Week when I was just about to uh, leave Milan. And um, so I ended up just did that, started working in the industry and then in lockdown started my brand. Amazing. So, I mean, if that university could see you now, they'll yeah. be kicking themselves. <laughs> um, you touched upon Vancouver Fashion Week. So that was your debut. How did that actually come about? Like, how did you get the, the place there? Yeah, so they actually approached me, again, just because I was posting online, like, I always say to people, uh, social media is like a free platform, like, mm. use it, because it's, like, how amazing that you can start a company these days and you just have this free marketing tool, like, it really is amazing. So I was just posting, like, all of my work that I was doing in Milan on Instagram, and I was approached by Vancouver Fashion Week, and they asked if I wanted to show a collection there. Mm -hmm. um, I'd never actually made a collection, I'd made, like, a few garments that would even be like presentable uh, at like a fashion week like so but I just said yes I was like I'm gonna regret it if I don't do it and then that summer I just worked super hard um I mean the pieces that I showcase if you'd taken them off the models you would have seen the insides were pretty <laughs> messy um but yeah I just I honestly I didn't have enough experience at that point um but I just like at that time, when you're starting out, you just want to say yes to every single opportunity. And I think it's the best thing to do. Absolutely. I mean, I think Vancouver's a pretty pretty cool place to, to start off. 
So obviously this was picked up by quite a lot of press. How did this kind of help to really launch your career? Press is kind of like a snowball effect. Like the more you have, the more you get. So that was really good. It helped me um, have exposure to like a new audience and to other uh, magazines and like press outlets. So that was like really beneficial. And then because of that press, I was approached um, to showcase at New York Fashion Week. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, like a really great opportunity. I basically just had to apply for sponsorship um, uh, to get like a sponsored show there. I didn't, I did not think I would get it for like a second, like seriously, I applied for it and then kind of just almost forgot about it. And I remember it was uh, Christmas Eve, uh, like 2018, I think. And I got an email saying I'd been accepted and I was just like in shock. I was like <laughs> so excited, but at the same time I was like, oh my gosh, this is in a month. I have to make a whole collection and I just could not enjoy my Christmas day. Cause I was like, I don't, I don't even know. Like I've not even thought about what I'm going to design, what I'm going to do, like a concept. I hadn't thought about any of it because I just didn't think yeah. it was possible to actually be accepted. So that was really cool. But even despite like showing at uh, Vancouver and New York, I still definitely wasn't ready to start a brand. Like I was 19 at the time and I just needed so much more experience. Um, I knew like if I started an online website, because I was essentially showing collections that weren't available to buy. I was taking custom orders and I was doing freelance work to fund it, um, but I didn't have like a physical website where you could just click and buy something. And the reason I didn't was because I thought, okay, if I'm gonna sell stuff online, I know my sewing level isn't strong enough, so I'm gonna have to outsource, which is super expensive, and I just didn't have any money to like put into that. Um, but then in lockdown, like I was really lucky because I basically got the gift of time and I just practiced like every day for five months. Cause I was like, I've always wanted to start a brand. That is like my end goal, um, but I'm not doing it because like I don't have money to put into it or like my sewing level is not good enough. It's like, you can always find excuses not to do something. And I just said to myself, okay, well, how about I make my sewing level like good enough then? And then when I felt like I was like ready and confident with my skills, uh, I just started it from there and handmade every piece at mm. the beginning. It's almost like the brand went backwards. So yeah. you went from, you know, New York Fashion Week to being like, right, how do we, yeah. how, how do we create honestly, this? Honestly, it was like quite humbling because when you're at New York Fashion Week, you think you're like, I don't know, it's so glamorous and you think it's so cool. And then you kind of go home and you're just like, okay, but I've not really sold anything. So like, <laughs> what's like actually the point? Like, seriously, it's like, it's something that comes up in business a lot. Like, are you doing something to feed your ego or are you doing something because it's generally best for you and the company? Um, and 19 year old me, like when I'm getting messages from pe people asking me to like, do this and this and this, which sounds amazing. I'm just like, yes, 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 yes. And now I'm definitely more selective over what I like choose to do. It has to benefit like the company. Like you have to make, if, if you want to be a designer, you have to be making money. Like you have to commercialize yourself, like in a sense. And mm -hmm. yeah, taking that step back was definitely the right thing to do. Kind of touching back upon New York, you created a collection that was called Places We've Been Touched, where you essentially give women the platform to talk about such a needed issue. And I think, you know, as a designer, you kind of have the power to really talk about issues that are needed to be spoken about, um, i.e. kind of climate change at the moment. You know, how can you use the platform to, to really hit home um, and talk about it? I think it's just about being transparent and truthful because there's things that I'm not doing that like I could I could be focusing on sustainability more, like in certain aspects, like we sometimes use um, plastic based fibers, even though we try to use recycled fabrics and stuff as much as we can, it's not possible to be completely sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important to admit that because fashion's about consumption. So it's about how can I do my best uh, to be sustainable? So Emmy Studios, all of our packaging is reusable, recyclable, compostable, or made of recycled materials. Um, our light crows are all made from uh, like recycled yarns. And for me, the biggest uh, like differentiator between a fast fashion brand and an independent label um, is just like the time that goes in to like every single decision, every single like design decision, the production, the sampling, everything. These big fast fashion companies, they'll see a bodysuit on Kylie Jenner on a Tuesday and they'll have 500 units of that, of a dupe of that bodysuit in their UK warehouse by Friday. So they will have designed, sampled, had 500 units produced and shipped from a manufacturing facility that's 
like probably in like China. Mm. Um, and what happens is that not only does that put loads of pressure on the manufacturing facility and the workers, but um, there's often like issues with design or production and a lot of the pieces have to go uh, to landfill, end up in landfill. They're just chucking product away because not enough time and energy and effort has gone into making those products perfect. Like for our recent collection, the sampling process was about four months long because I just had to make sure that every single detail was not only like aesthetically perfect, but functionally perfect. Um, so I think that's the big differentiator between uh, independent labels and fast fashion brands. I think it's not, as a consumer, you know, we aren't aware of like the back end and kind of how long it really takes to make something perfect. Um, so it's really interesting to know that your most recent collection, you know, sampling alone was four months. So I do want to talk about the new collection. Um, currently, you do two capsules a year. Um, and kind of with that, you know, because you are competing against trends and these kind of fast fashion companies, do you feel there's a pressure to be doing more to kind of keep up with the, the ever-changing trends and, you know, how fast those fast fashion companies can really churn out pieces? I think there's always going to be that pressure to, like, release more or... Uh, like take part in Black Friday or, you know, like, cause all of the other big brands are doing it. I think it's just important to find an audience who understand that what I'm doing is almost, or what other independent brands are doing isn't really comparable to what like Boohoo and Pretty Little Thing are doing. So yeah, I think there's always gonna be that pressure. Um, and I think the, the other hard thing is trying to communicate to people who aren't in the fashion industry, the like the sheer difference between what I'm doing and what, a fast fashion brand is doing like the process is so like contrasting like everything about it is just like completely different and that's why for example like the price point's different mm -hmm. um but i think having a, that kind of like transparent open communication with your audience whether that's through like instagram or tiktok that really helps because it gives people an insight into like the work i'm putting in and how like the process behind everything i make and how that really just is not the same as like the process behind like a PLT, yeah. uh, like two pound top, like, do you know what I mean? Please talk us through the first piece you have here. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the pieces in our new collection. It's a maxi skirt. Um, my favorite thing about it is it's customizable. So you can like clip the clips like wherever you want. You can kind of like arrange it in the way that you like it. Um, and yeah, it's definitely our most kind of like technical piece we've done. Lots of zip pockets, lots of hardware, you yeah, know, super cool. And then kind of moving on to the next one, this is your Lycra, recycled Lycra tops. Yeah. So talk us through the, the kind of print on it. Do you kind of create this yourself? Yeah, so we do these in-house. Uh, this one was actually made by one of my employees, Mia. Uh, she is like so, so talented. She, she did this all like on Photoshop. And yeah, they're printed onto our recycled Lycra. Yeah, so this set, it's like a unisex uh, shorts and t-shirt set. Super comfy here, you can feel the fabric. I love Super like thick fabric. Oh, it's, it's quite heavy. Yeah, I hate, like my pet hate is like thin t-shirts. Yeah. So I have to have like a proper like nice thick t-shirt. But yeah, this is another print that we designed. Um, touching upon TikTok, I know that you use TikTok to promote um, Imi Studios and obviously TikTok is a great place to build a following and a community um, of which you kind of already have. But I suppose like on TikTok, do you feel pressure to be creating content that you know is going to, you know, bring in the views, bring in the likes and um, get seen because it's trending? So can you kind of be authentically yourself and get your own kind of brand message out? Or are you kind of restricted to be like, OK, this is like what I know is going to trend and get people to, to see it? I think you have to do both. So everything I post is authentically me and there'll be an essence of me and my brand like within the video but of course you have to conform to trends like at the end of the day I'm using TikTok as a marketing platform um so I want to get views I'm using it to like basically promote my work um so yeah you definitely have to conform to like the sound trends and you know all these <laughs> kind of things but you can do it in your own way and do it in a way that's personal to you and I do think people value um, authentic content as well so you don't want to be like jumping from trend to trend to trend changing your content around 
because I think people can see through that and they know that's not really you. And I know on social media you have kind of mentioned about how you spend maybe 17 hours um, a day, you know, sewing to kind of get your orders out. Um, obviously, you know, you do that because you love the brand and you want it to work. Um, and obviously we know these kind of fast fashion brands really exploit their workers where maybe they're forced to work, you know, 17 hours a day and they get as little as 3p an item. Um, and this is obviously why those fast fashion companies can really sell at such a lower price point. Talk us through kind of your price point and maybe how as consumers we can start to understand that a bit more. So I think the issue is that the general public have such a warped perspective of what things actually cost. Um, so for example, I find myself influenced by fast fashion prices because I actually would want to charge more for my clothing because of the time, like energy that go into it, like the cost of my materials are like quite high um, because I'm an independent brand. And I would want my price point to be higher, but because I know that a lot of my customers are buying from like H&M, like Pretty Little Thing, all these brands, their anchor for like how much clothing should cost is all the way over here. And I shouldn't have to move myself like towards that because I know that that clothing isn't being made fairly and it's not being made well. Um, so that is actually the wrong price. And the price that I'm charging is like right. Um, it's so hard to change like public opinion uh, and educate people. But I think social media is obviously such a good way to do that. Um, and I definitely think my audience understand like the work that goes in uh, to my garments and the fact that they're going to last. Like why buy 10 tops that are going to be within landfill within a year when you could buy something that you could like hand down to your, the next generation and something you can cherish. I just love valuing like stuff that I buy. I think it's really important um, to treat like your belongings with like care and respect. Mm -hmm. This um, really echoes your brand slogan, which is choose well, buy less. Um, and kind of how do you really hold yourself accountable to that? If you buy something of high quality, it's going to last longer. So yeah, what's your kind of advice for people to really hold themselves accountable to this? Yeah, so I think a lot of people, um, and I've b like been guilty of this as well, will sporadically go online if you're in a bad mood or if you're bored or if you're sad or if you've got a party the next day that you don't have anything to wear to, like you'll go online and you'll just sporadically order something and you've not really thought it through. Um, and I think it's just really important like when you are buying something to be really mindful of like, why are you buying that? Can I, will I rewear this next year? Will, do I have five different outfits I can style this with? So I think if you're looking to kind of go on a more sustainable journey when it comes to fashion, a really great way to start is to get a piece in your wardrobe that you've not worn in ages and try and come up with a few new ways to style it with other stuff that you have. Because usually the answers are in your wardrobe already. Like you forget what you have. Like everyone these days has so many clothes. And I think it's something even like I need to do more of. Uh, just like think you have new creative ways to style stuff that you already own. I mean, I think it's such a good idea. And I, you know, it's something that if you live with housemates or you have, you know, siblings or friends, um, kind of, you know, going to each other's houses and going through each other's wardrobes and being yeah. like, okay, like let's swap this yeah, or, you yeah. know, you haven't worn this. Um, but you have obviously created some pieces that have been picked up by um, some quite big names. Um, do you maybe want to give us a, an insight to how Doja Cat happened? Yeah, so it was funny because her stylist messaged me saying, me and Doja love your stuff. And I was like, oh, cool. But I was like, I mean, she's probably not actually seen it, like whatever. Just replied being like, thanks, didn't think much of it. And then I remember me and my boyfriend were walking down the street and he was like to me, anything to report, like anything been happening like with the brand? And I was like, oh, yeah, I was like, actually quite cool. Like Doja Cat's stylist followed me. And he was like, who's Doja Cat? Like literally, have you been living under a rock? So I got up her Insta to show him and it was like, it said that she followed me and I was like, Wait, what? So I was like, I'm so, like, I hadn't even noticed. Um, and then I ended up messaging her. Uh, she got back to me and I ended up sending her um, a bunch of pieces, some custom stuff. Uh, and she follows so many like small brands or like independent creators. It's super cool. Um, so I think also just having someone with like that much um, influence, mm -hmm. uh, champion small brands and like independent designers. I think it like sets a really good precedent for other people and hopefully other like celebrities will follow suit. I know in the past that you've had some of your designs stolen. 
Um, do you kind of want to touch upon that? Yeah, so there have been a few occasions where um, bigger brands have ripped off some of my ideas or designs. Uh, and there's also been multiple uh, occasions where a brand, well, a company like Amazon or uh, AliExpress, or even I've seen them on Etsy, will actually use my images to sell like a dupe of my product. And I actually ordered one of the Amazon dresses uh, just to see what it was like, because the cost of the dress was less than the cost of my materials. Um, so I was like, how are they? And it was also, there was a print on it. And I was like, how have they, have they even like got access to this print? Because I've only posted photos of it on like someone wearing the dress. So it's crazy like what they can do. But when it arrived, I realized why it was so cheap. I mean, it was almost like not even, it didn't even look like the dress. Like it didn't, it made me feel better because I was like, anyone who buys this hoping to get a dress that looks like mine, like isn't going to be a happy customer. But no, it's definitely uh, disappointing. So actually, um, this is one of my friends on the front, Faye. She's an absolute legend. That's why it's called the Faye dress. Okay, love that. Uh, and yeah, unfortunately, this is one of the pieces that was ripped off by Amazon. Um, but honestly, if you, if you saw it in real life, you wouldn't even recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so different, yeah. This is the dress that they copied. They've even used pictures from my website and Instagram as their product shots. So illegal, I know. And they also copied the blue version as well. So, I decided to order one. I thing is, I don't know what to expect because we took this image of my friend at a shoot and it's like, I don't know where they've got an image like this even from. Oh my God. I'm screaming, right? I need to put this on. My version, the Amazon dupe. This is so shit. Like, honestly, this is so shit. This is why you buy from the small independent brands that spend hours and hours and hours creating clothing instead of this cheap shite. Yeah, and this is our Una hat. I mean, they're just, they're so well made as well. Like, they're so thick. It's actually a, quite a hard piece for fast fashion brands to copy because uh, good quality fur is just like it's generally just so expensive mm -hmm. and also these are all finished um, by hand uh, so you can't actually do it by machine which is like another reason it's hard to find like a good dupe. You've had some not so great experiences with celebrities um, and kind of maybe talk us through a bit about that kind of the, the back end of really how these brands and independent designers are kind of exploited. A lot goes on behind the scenes um, and a lot of small brands will probably be able to relate to this. Um, I guess a lot of these big stylists, um, because they like have these like amazing careers and they have these amazing clients and stuff, they do kind of feel like they can walk all over these small brands that need the exposure. Like there, I, there have been times where, um, like for example, uh, I was going on holiday with my boyfriend. We were going camping. We like just arrived at the place, went to the supermarket, bought all of our food to have like a barbecue the next day, all this stuff. And I got an email from a celebrity's stylist, I won't, I won't say who it was, uh, saying, I need this, 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 this in LA in like three days. So I literally said bye to my boyfriend, drove all the way home, made all the pieces, shipped them out, like missed like the trip, everything. And then they just never got used. And then they just never got back to me. It's like a lot of that. So I think also if, any like aspiring designers are listening to this, I would say always have a contract in place because even if someone is this like huge celebrity stylist and got all these followers, like it doesn't mean they're gonna act with integrity all the time. Um, so just like keep your wits about you and be, be careful. But yeah, I think it's hard for small brands because like they really need that exposure. Um, and they'll, like I would literally do like so much to, ha to have had that celebrity worn out. Like I literally like left that trip. Um, but for them, it's like not, um, yeah. it doesn't matter as much. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to know the, the back end of that. And if we see a celebrity in kind of one of those independent designers pieces that maybe not There's always There's like another the... 10 that yeah. they've sent it to who have like just ignored them. Yeah, yeah definitely. Sure. Um, and just kind of lastly, what is the future plans for Amy Studios? Is it going to be more sustainable? How do you kind of see, you know, um, the impact that fashion's really having on the, the world today? How is Amy Studios going to kind of help combat that? So obviously I mentioned previously that when I started my brand, I didn't have any money to put into it. So I just had to hand make everything. 
that's basically what I've been doing for the past two years. So I've been hand making to order, like to minimize waste, which is really important to me. Uh, but I still do want to scale. So we have our recent collection. Most of it was outsourced. Um, but I want to scale without compromising like the integrity of the brand and the sustainable nature of the brand, uh, which is definitely possible, but you've just got to be really mindful when doing that. So the manufacturer that I've just started working with, they're a Europe-based, uh, female-led, small batch manufacturing facility. And the best thing about them is they have zero minimum order quantities, which means I can basically buy low volumes of product, test how it sells, and then if it sells, buy more without having like um, like a hundred of something left over that didn't sell. Um, so trying to find, trying to partner with the right manufacturer was like a big thing for me. Um, and in the next five years, I just hope to continue to scale sustainably and slowly and mindfully. Um, and hopefully more people will be wearing my stuff and more people will be converted to the kind of buy less, uh, choose well ethos. Yeah, yeah for sure.